Barbara, open your Bibles, if you would, please, to John chapter number 8, the book of John chapter 8.
And as you find that, if you are able, in honor of God's word, please stand. We'll begin reading with verse number 25. Then said they unto him, Who art thou? And Jesus saith unto them, Even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true, and I speak the, uh, to the world those things which I have heard of him. Notice there, Jesus said, I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. They understood not that he spake unto them of the Father. Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. Notice he said, I do nothing of myself, but I do the, uh, the things that my Father, and speak the things that my Father hath taught me. And then he, uh, as we read on, and he that sent me is with me, and the Father hath not left me alone. And this last statement is the text for today. For I do always those things that please him. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we ask that you would bless your word as it goes forth today as we consider the thought of pleasing you, what it takes, what we must be like, what we should be if we're going to please you. We know that your son Jesus pleased you in all things. So he becomes our example. Help us to learn from your word, from his example, how to please you. And we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. That last phrase in our text, Jesus said, I do always those things which please him. Now that's quite a statement and really the only <clears throat> one that could ever make that would be the Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> Excuse me. He is the only perfect one. He is the only one without sin. And certainly his life betrayed that. But that statement tells us several things. The first thing we learn from that statement is that God is pleased by some things. In other words, there are some things that you and I can do to please God. As the Lord Jesus pleased God in all things, there are things that every one of us can do to please God. God can be pleased by some things. But it also leaves the opposite thought. There are things that God is not pleased with. There are some other things that do not please him. And we have to be careful. In our society today, it is easy to get off track and get involved in too many things that do not please God. But Jesus always did the things that pleased the Father. Now we're all different when it comes to things that please us. We're all different when it comes to things that we want and what we want to be like. I personally believe that I'm not hard to please. Now, I know there's a few people that would disagree with that. But I'm entitled to my opinion with that. So, whether I'm hard to please or not hard to please, it really doesn't matter. Because in the end, it is the Heavenly Father that we are to please. That is who we are to be like. When it comes to food, it's obvious that I'm not hard to please. There are a few things that I'm not going to touch. 
But pretty much, I'll eat food that's put before me. But when it comes to life, there are many who are unhappy. Many, even of God's people, who are unhappy with life and their, their place in life. And some of them have come to the place where they think, well, if I just had more money, I'd be happy. More wealth. But we have to understand that life is more than the accumulation of things. If we make those things the object of happiness, the goal to find happiness, we'll be sorely disappointed. We should have a desire to please the Lord with our life. Now, it's clear. All you have to do is look at society. Most people in this world only have a desire to please themselves. It seems that that philosophy is found in all areas of our lives. Church, work, family, on and on with that. And so we are told and we've come to believe in the last 30, 40 years that if you don't take care of number one, who's going to take care of him? You being number one. We have that philosophy that uh, what I want is more important than what God has to say. <clears throat> but for a true believer, all of this changes. Our focus no longer is upon ourselves. Our focus is upon the will of God and the direction that God gives us in life. Our focus is on pleasing him. But how are we to please him? Let me give you some areas today. How we can please God. First of all, God is pleased with salvation. God is pleased when someone trusts Christ. When you personally receive him as your savior. Luke 15 and verse 10 says, Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that cometh to repentance. Or one sinner that repenteth. In other words, in heaven there's joy when someone gets saved. Think about it for a moment. It pleases God. In chapter 15, three things were lost. The parables deal with those three things. Each one represents a lost soul. A sheep was lost. He had no direction. A coin was in darkness without life. And a son was in rebellion without satisfaction in his life. Each of them was found, and when they were found, there was great rejoicing. God is pleased when we get saved. It makes sense that God would be pleased when we get saved because he sent his own son into the world to die for our sins. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. If God did that much for a soul to be saved, certainly it would please him when one gets saved. I think God is also pleased when we seek to reach others with the gospel. John 15 and verse 8 says, Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. But if you want to please God, first you must be saved. 
then we must get busy telling others, reaching others with the message of the gospel that they might also accept Christ. God's word, word to us is pretty simple. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So if we're not saved and we're not involved in carrying the gospel to the world, if we're not involved in seeing people come to Christ, both here and around the world, I could tell you that we're probably not pleasing God because he loves you so much he sent a son to die for you. What a rejection of that love when you reject the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, when you postpone it. But what a rejection also to share uh, when we do not share that news with a lost and dying world. Well, secondly today, God is also pleased when we are obedient to him, with our obedience. God was pleased with Jesus' obedience. In our text, as it said, I, I do always those things which please him. There are two separate occasions, two different occasions, where God spoke directly from heaven during the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And both times, he voiced his pleasure concerning his son Jesus. When Jesus was baptized, and he came up out of the water, the scripture says, and lo, a voice from heaven spake saying, this is my beloved son, and then the next word, in whom I am well pleased. When Jesus was, by the way, if God was pleased when Jesus was baptized, uh, don't you think he would be pleased when we follow his command to be baptized after being saved? But God said of, of him at this time, this was his baptism. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Matthew 17 and verse 15, uh, verse 5 says, While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Twice the heavenly Father spoke and said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. This occasion was at the transfiguration of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it is clear that Jesus knew that he came to do the will of God and to finish his work. We read that in our text, but uh, Jesus said in John 4 and verse 34, said it this way, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. So he understood what pleased God. He understood his responsibility. I want to submit to you today that very few Christians do not know the will of God. But very few Christians really are involved in doing the will of God. There's a difference between knowing and doing. James said we need to be doers of the word and not hearers only. Well, Jesus did that which pleased the Father. And God is pleased by our obedience also. God makes it clear the right things. He has... And he's pleased with our obedience to the plan for the family. Wives please God by their submission to their husbands. Husbands please God by their love for their wives. Children please God by their obedience to their parents. That's a Bible plan. <clears throat> a 
wonder how pleasing we are with our families today. We all please him when we serve him with singleness, singleness of heart. That's true. But there are other things in the scripture that God directs us and tells us what he wants us to do. Jesus said, I always do those things which please my father. When we know what pleases him and we do not do them, then it becomes one of those things that do not please or does not please. In his word, the Bible, God has instructed us on many areas of obedience. For example, baptism is a matter of obedience to the Lord's command. Attendance to the local church when we're told not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as a matter of some is, that's a matter of obedience to God's word. Giving of our tithes and offerings is a matter of obedience to God's word. Getting involved in the ministry or serving him in different areas, that's a matter of obedience to God's word. Can we say, I do always those things which please my father. We need to consider our obedience in these areas. Are we really pleasing God? You remember what Jesus said one time? He said, why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Basically what he's saying is, you have no right to say that I'm your Lord if you will not do those things which I direct you. That's a powerful statement. We are instructed in God's word how to live as a God's children. And yet we're not. And then thirdly, God is pleased with our faith. Remember the testimony of Enoch? The scripture says in Hebrews 11 and verse 5, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. Enoch was one of two men in the scripture who were taken into heaven before they died. Elijah was the other. The Bible says that Enoch walked with God. He walked with God for 365 years. And then God took him. What a wonderful testimony is found in that text that God is pleased with a life of faith. Remember, the last part of... Hebrews 11, 5, he had this testimony that he pleased uh, God. Wow. I wonder what, how my faith would match up. I wonder if we just talk about living by faith or are we living by faith? Well, I can tell you if things keep you a nervous wreck, you may not be living by faith. I can tell you if you're stressed out all the time, you might not be living by faith. The Bible says that we walk by faith and not by sight. Enoch did the right thing. Hebrews eleven six reminds us that without faith, it is impossible to please him. If we're going to do those things which please God, then we have to recognize faith is an essential thing in doing that. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So without faith, we cannot please God. Now, 
the truth is, all of us are going to have time when our faith wavers. Peter had enough faith to ask the Lord to let him walk on water, and he walked for a few moments till he got his eyes off Jesus and his eyes on the storm. The problem that we have is our focus. We're looking at the wrong things. And when we do that, then we begin to sink like Peter. We must be careful. The walk of a believer is to be a walk of faith. Again, the scripture says, for we walk by faith and not by sight. It doesn't matter how things look. It matters where we look. That makes the difference. It doesn't matter about the circumstances. It matters about who is in control of the circumstances and do I believe that he is? And am I willing to commit my circumstances to him and trust him to take care of them? When it says we walk by faith and not by sight, it simply means trusting the word of God as we live our daily lives. Anything else is not pleasing to him. Too often, we allow our lives to be controlled by material things, by problems, by negative circumstances. But God wants you and I to learn to trust him and to walk by faith and realize it's not dependent upon us that he will supply all of our need. Oh, how we forget that. Oh, how we forget that we have a God that's bigger than any problem that you can have. We need to be careful of that. God wants us to trust him and to walk by faith and to realize that he is a supply and when we do, he receives the glory. You cannot please God in the flesh. We need to remember that. Romans 8 and verse 8 says, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. That simply means I can't please him in my own strength. I can't please him with my own knowledge. I can't leave him out of anything. It means that in our own strength and power, we are incapable of pleasing him. Now, it is true. We can go through the motions. We can say the right words. And we can even do some right things. But if it is in the power of the flesh, God isn't impressed. He never is. Fear him. Place our hope in his mercy. That's how we please him. Psalm 147, verse 11, says, The Lord taketh pleasure in them that fear him, in, those, in, them that, excuse me, in those that hope in his mercy. The Lord is pleasured by those who reverence him, that fear him, and those who put their hope and their trust in him. The Lord takes pleasure in them. then we need to praise him and be thankful. Psalm 69, verse 30 and 31 says, I will praise the name of God with a song and will magnify him with thanksgiving. This shall also please the Lord. Those are things that the scripture tells us they're very simple to find that pleases the Lord. So, do you fear him? Reverence him. 
really worship him? That pleases him. Do you praise his name? Or when they sing a song, a hymn, do you go like this and say, I shall not be moved? Think about it for a moment. Let me read that to you again. I will praise the name of God with a song. This shall also please the Lord. That might say something for Baptist song services sometimes. If we cannot praise the Lord. I will praise him with a song and magnify him with thanksgiving. That pleases him. So this morning, if you are here without Jesus Christ, God would be pleased for you to accept his son Jesus as your personal savior. That would please him. That is God's will for your life, actually. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So if you want to please the Lord, you need to start by receiving the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. That changes your whole life. That actually changes the life of those around you. Because God is pleased with the salvation of souls. But he's also pleased with our obedience when we obey those things that he has directed us. He's also pleased by our faith when there are things that we can't control, but we know that God can and we let him control them. So the question for you and I to answer, is God pleased with me? Make it personal. Ask yourself, is God pleased with me? Is he, is he pleased with your concern for souls? Is he pleased with our obedience and our faith? As a Christian, ask yourself, is God pleased with me? If you're not saved, we know that he isn't pleased, but he will be if you'll trust him as your Savior. Let's stand together and bow our heads for prayer. While heads are bowed and eyes are closed and no one's looking around, Jesus said, I do always those things which please my Father that please him. What are we doing to please him? Does your life please him? If not, for whatever reason, here's a place for you to come and a place for you to pray, a place for you to meet God. Before I pray, I wonder if there's one that would just simply say, preacher, I'm not saved. I've never been saved. I know that I need to be saved. I know that it would please God. Would you please pray for me? I need to know Christ as my Savior. Is there one like that? Well, no one looks. I wonder if there's another that would say, Preacher, I'm a Christian, but God is not pleased with some areas of my life. I need to get those right. I need to be in a position where the Heavenly Father is pleased with me. Would you pray for me? Just lift your hand for a moment. Yes, thank you. Others, several around the auditorium. Another? Thank you. God bless you. There are different things that God might speak to your heart about that he might not speak to the next person. It might be your church attendance. It might be baptism. It may be church membership. It may be service. It may be carrying out the Great Commission. I named a number of things in the sermon. Is there another?
preacher, pray for me. God speaking to my heart. Then Heavenly Father, as we continue the service with the invitation hymn, we recognize that you have spoken to many of us today. There are things in our lives which do not please you that we need to make right. Now's the time for us to start. Help us to come to this altar and make that commitment to be pleasing to you, either as receiving Jesus as Savior or as being obedient to the commands of your word. We ask that you would bless this invitation time, and we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.